Hello and welcome everyone to 8R Notes. Today we are going to cover lecture in biology. But first of all, let me introduce you to 8R Notes. It's essentially a company that provides free resources and paid ones to students. Some of our free resources are study notes, lectures, discussions, videos, we also provide it with newsletters, an 8R calculator, which I know a lot of you are going to be using during your VC journey. Uh, we also provide articles and a lot more resources, which I would highly recommend you guys have access to because they are free. We also provide you with some paid resources, which I would highly recommend, especially Chute Smart, which is essentially um, live online classes but they are really good because essentially the people that are tutoring you are top vc graduates they are phenomenal and i would highly recommend you sign up because it's very very affordable for um for you guys and honestly um a lot of value there study guides uh, we also have study guides. These you have to pay for as well, but they're really good. And there is a study guide for every subject almost. So I would have, if I were you, I would just have a look if you like any of them. And then there is also Ed Unlimited. Now, Ed Unlimited is a really cool one because uh, you do have access to hundreds of study guides and And much more. For example, you have access to practice sacks, practice exams. Um, they're all awesome. Awesome. Now, I would also like to thank you, our partners, such as La Trobe University, before we continue with our lecture. Today we are going to cover, as I said, as I mentioned at the beginning, today is a lecture about VCE Biology Units 1 and 2. Now we are going to cover a lot of content, but I don't want you guys to feel un uncomfortable or that we are going to rush through any of it. Actually, I will purposefully take it very, very slowly through a lot of the concepts which it takes a bit of time to understand. You can follow our progress with the progress bar at the bottom, and I hope it helps you a lot. Now, just to double check, everything is working. Yep. Now, let's start with the plasma membrane. The plasma membrane is actually a really, really complicated one. The plasma membrane is a really complicated one because a lot of people um, get confused, rightfully so. Um, the concept itself, uh, it takes a bit of time to explain. That's why there is a lot when it comes to the plasma membrane. Actually, what you guys need to learn is the fluke mosaic model of the plasma membrane, which is even more complicated. So according to the study design, you need to learn about the fluid mosaic model of the plasma membrane and its phospholipid bilayer nature. So let's start slowly through, let's start to explain each part, but slowly. First of all, the plasma membrane is essentially a membrane that surrounds a cell, a eukaryotic cell, right? The now the cell obviously has the nucleus, the nucleolus, and its organelles in the cytoplasm, where the cytoplasm is the cytosol, which is the fluid, plus organelles. The plasma membrane itself maintains the structural integrity of the cell. 
So it has a really important function. And on top of that, it also controls, it controls the materials that can come in, but also out of the cell. So as you can see, it plays a really, really important role for a cell. The plasma membrane pay, plays a super important role for the cell. But what is it made up of? Well, the plasma membrane is made up of a phospholipid bilayer. The phospholipid bilayer is essentially made up of units which we call a phospholipid. A phospholipid is this molecule with a phosphate head, a polar phosphate head, and non-polar lipid tails. Now, the lipid tails are essentially a hydrocarbon chain. A hydrocarbon chain is non-polar, but the phosphate head is polar. Now, why am I mentioning non-polar and polar so often? Because you need to understand that this plasma membrane, obviously, like I showed you before, oops, uh, it's not working properly. Yep. This plasma membrane that I showed you before encapsulates it encapsulates all of the cell, right? It wraps around the cell. So let's assume it goes over the edges here. This is the nucleus, right? This is the extracellular fluid and intracellular fluid. The extracellular fluid is the fluid between one cell and another cell, right? It's in between. The extracellular fluid is the fluid outside of the cell. Now, bear with me because it takes a bit of time to explain this. The fluid is primarily made up of water. Where water molecules themselves, again, we know the formula is H2O, are essentially oxygen atom bonded to two hydrogen atoms. Where the oxygen atom has a higher affinity for electrons. Therefore, the oxygen end will be a negative end, it will form a negative ball for the molecule. Whereas as it is attracting the electrons towards itself, it will leave the hydrogen nucleus exposed. Now we know the nucleus has protons and neutrons in it. The neutrons do not have a charge. The protons have a positive charge. Therefore, by exposing the nucleus of the hydrogen, the hydrogen side of the water molecule will be positively charged. It will be a positive, it will have a positive polarity, right? A positive pole. So this means that there is a permanent dipole formed with the water molecule. Now, why is that important? That is important because the phospholipid, which is the basic building block of the plasma membrane, is made up of a phosphate head and lipid tails. A phosphate head and lipid tails, where the phosphate head is polar, but the lipid tails are non-polar. Now, polar molecules are hydrophilic.
that means water loving. There is also hydro. There is also hydrophobic, which means water hating, where hydro means water and phobic means to hate. Therefore, since the phosphate head it has affinity for water, it loves being surrounded by water, it will orientate itself towards water or where water is, that is in the extracellular environment and intracellular environment. It will or or orientate itself towards these two environments. That's why both on the outside of the plasma membrane and on the inside of the plasma membrane not on the inside both on the side surround facing the extracellular fluid and the side facing the intracellular fluid we look at phosphate heads and the lipid tails will be facing towards one another And since there is two layers of these phospholipids where the phosphate, he phosphate heads are orientating themselves towards water and the lipid tails towards themselves, a phospholipid bilayer is formed. So now we've covered the first main point according to the study design about the plasma membrane. The bilayer nature of the plasma membrane again phospholipid bilayer now we know why it is a bilayer we know why they are arranged in the way they are arranged but there is a second component to what the study design dot point refers to and that is the fluid mosaic model of it now you understand that the plasma membrane is a bilayer but we still have uncovered why do we call it a fluid mosaic model now let's break down the very first part which is the fluid part of that statement why do we say that the plasma membrane is fluid well remember these phospholipids they are a phosphate head attached to two lipid tails where the phosphate head and the lipid tails are covalently bonded to one another where covalent bonds are intra molecular forces of attraction, right? They are intramolecular bonding. It is intramolecular bonding. It is a really, really strong form of bonding. It takes a lot of energy to break those bonds. And they are very rigid. However, there is also something that we call intermolecular forces of attraction. That is forces of attraction between phospholipids themselves, between one phospholipid and the other phospholipid. These intermolecular forces of attraction are between molecules, right? Sometimes they can be dispersion forces, they can be dipole-dipole bonding, hydrogen bonding, but in this case, let's focus on dispersion forces. Now, obviously, if you've had studied a bit of chemistry, this would probably make a lot more sense, but even if you haven't, that is all right. So these phospholipids, which are adjacent to one another, if you take a very close look, they are really adjacent to each other. Let me zoom in to show you guys. Can you see how they are right next to each other? The tails and the phosphate head, as I said before, those are covalently bonded it's really hard to break that bond but between these two phospholipids there's no covalent bonding it's intermolecular forces of attraction now that is really important because it means that these molecules are actually free to move right they are free to move they are free to rotate they are free to do whatever they want not to rotate obviously they still have to maintain this orientation but they're free to again 
uh, move around. So that helps us to understand the fluid part, the fluid statement, when the study design mentions the fluid mosaic model of the plasma membrane. How about the mosaic part? Well, as you can see, the phospholipid bilayer, it's not just phospholipids. It's not just two layers of phospholipids. You can see that there are different kinds of proteins embedded into it. There is cholesterol. There are glycoproteins, channel proteins, carrier proteins, receptors, right? Everywhere. Therefore, it's like a mosaic. A lot of things are embedded on the plasma membrane for a very good reason, because they facilitate a lot of uh, they carry out a lot of functions, really important ones actually, right? Like the sodium potassium pump. Um, so yeah, a lot of it is really important. And cholesterol as well. Let's start with cholesterol. Why is cholesterol embedded? That is cholesterol. That is cholesterol, right? That's cholesterol. Actually, fun fact. The cholesterol that you see here is actually a steroid. A steroid is any molecule that has a ring structure, right? It has that ring structure right there. Now, obviously, if you build upon that ring structure, you can make different types of steroids. For example, estrogen is a steroid. Testosterone is a steroid. A steroid is actually a general statement that refers to any molecule uh, that has that ring structure. Just a fun statement. And because it has a hydrocarbon ring structure, is actually the cholesterol molecule is actually a non-polar molecule because it is a hydrocarbon, right? It has only dispersion forces. But that is the very same reason why it is embedded throughout the plasma membrane. And this is a beautiful thing, right? The way the cell is organized. The cholesterol is embedded in the plasma membrane to maintain the structural integrity of the plasma membrane. It reinforces those intermolecular forces of attraction between the lipid tails, maintaining, again, a rigid plasma membrane. Fluid, but rigid at the same time, right? So it maintains that structural integrity of the cell itself. How about the proteins, some of you might ask. If you heard me mention before, I said something along the lines of a sodium-potassium pump, right? I mentioned something along the lines of a carrier protein. Why? Well, the cell obviously is surrounded by this plasma membrane, but not every form of a molecule can actually go through there. Small molecules, sure, they can go through, but not large molecules like glucose. And we're going to cover glucose later, uh, how photosynthesis and respiration occurs. Don't worry, we're going to cover that later. But our cells need glucose because glucose is broken down in the mitochondria in its source of energy, source of ADP. But it cannot go through the plasma membrane. That's the problem. It can't go through. So there are proteins embedded in the plasma membrane that carry out this function. They open up and close to allow molecules to go through the plasma membrane. And that's the function of a lot of the things that are embedded in the plasma membrane. All of these protein channels, carrier proteins, they aid in what we call facilitated diffusion or active transport. Now, facilitated diffusion and active transport are two different things. When I said facilitated diffusion, I meant that facilitated diffusion and active transport, they're not the same, but uh, proteins help with both of those functions. Now, since we are in the topic of diffusion, let's cover how molecules go through this plasma membrane. How do they go through this plasma membrane? Well, they go through this plasma membrane through what we call um, active or passive transport. Now, I'm trying to access my pen here, but obviously the, it's, it's being... Being a, the slides are being a bit annoying. 
So what is active and passive transport? Well, active and passive transport is essentially the transport of molecules according to or against the concentration gradient. So if there are a lot of molecules on one side of the plasma membrane, they will have a tendency by nature to go towards the other side from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. Now, this can be simple diffusion, so small molecules can literally go straight through there, that's fine. It can be facilitated diffusion with the aid of carrier, mole carrier proteins, or it can be active transport where things are going against the concentration gradient and you need the energy to do that in the form of ATP. But we're going to talk more about it later. Now, this was everything explained to you, but in the slide, right? So everything is there. I know it looks like a lot and it's probably quite a bit messy. Um, it's there for a reason. I did that for a reason. And that is to make it easier for you guys to understand what's happening, right? Because there is a lot to take in. Obviously, there are a bunch of slides here, which will explain what I just said, but in writing. Now, obviously, I don't want to bore you guys to death by just reading through slides. I would, I prefer explaining myself through an image. So I think that helps you guys more. But let's, let's go through some of the things that I didn't cover. First of all, a hydrophilic, hydrophilic molecule and a lipophobic molecule are one and the same. Lipophobic, lipophobic. Lipo means lipid. Phobic means to fear lipid. Hydrophilic means water loving. You can either be water loving and lipophobic, or you can be hydrophobic and lipophilic. You can't be hydrophobic and lipophobic because hydrophobic, you hate water. Lipophobic, Again, the molecules hate lipids, so the molecule can't hate water and lipids at the same time. That would be a very strange molecule, uh, right? So, one or the other. Uh, most of the time, I would highly recommend you stick to the hydro stuff, hydrophilic and hydrophobic, uh, the, rather than use the word lipophilic and lipophobic. There's nothing wrong with it. It's just that it's more popular to say hydrophilic, hydrophilic and hydrophobic. What you see in the slides here is again the what you see in the slides is the phospholipid. I think it's just a clearer image of what I explained before. Um, yeah. So that the phosphate molecule and that that's, those are the saturated and unsaturated fatty acids. Now, a quick mention here. The difference between saturated and unsaturated. Saturated, there are no double or triple bonds. Unsaturated means that there are double and triple bonds. Why do we call it unsaturated fatty acid? We call it unsaturated because actually you can technically speaking break that bond over there and attach other stuff to it. So, so just hydrogen and therefore make it a um, you can make it a full hydrocarbon now fun fact uh, really fun fact unsaturated molecules um, actually are quite good for you um, unsaturated fatty acids you can ask any doctor actually uh, they are really important um, because those are what we call omega-3 or omega-6. 
where omega is actually the last carbon and then we count backwards where omega 3 is the fact that there is a double bond located three carbons away from the last carbon or omega 6 there is a double bond located six carbons away from the last carbon so if you study chemistry you will be able to understand the naming of these molecules but yeah so um fun fact those are actually really important for you more omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids right so unsaturated fatty acids are good for you uh the problem with them is because there is a double bond that their nature is actually quite unstable and therefore they can be very easily oxidized and they spoil very quick that's why butter that you probably have in the fridge is primarily saturated because it can last longer longer shelf life and lower perishable costs to the market that sells it but not good for you anyways um uh, it's all uh, but by the way i promote a healthy diet um it's healthy to eat a bit of anything and anything that your doctor consults you but that was just a fun fact right uh, consult with your doctor for anything else. <laughs> I'm not giving nutritional advice. I'm just saying fun fact, double bond makes it unsaturated and uh, unstable. But still, the healthy molecules actually have that double bond, which is very interesting to me. Um, oh yes, uh, before we continue, the glycerol molecule. So what you see here is a glycerol, these three carbons. Yep, we call that a glycerol. Don't forget that. You'll need it later, trust me. Now, again, this slide will re-emphasize what I said before, that it's a mosaic model. The plasma membrane has a mosaic model. There are protein channels, uh, glycoproteins, glycolipids. In this case, um, these glycolipids and glycoproteins, the glyco part stands for uh, glycogen. So it's essentially referring to the hydrocarbon chain that you see here. It's like a carbohydrate kind of chain, but not really. And that is used as a receptor by the cell to communicate with other cells, which personally I found epic. Um, but yeah, what else have I covered or not covered? Uh, nothing much. Cool. So that's pretty much it i think i covered everything in the first slide besides some small stuff now the function of the cholesterol is actually really, really important i did state it before that this is these hydrocarbon uh, rings uh, are what makes cholesterol a steroid and other things build on top of it to make testosterone and other hormones i guess But according to the Vika study design, it is actually very crucial for you guys, super crucial in, uh, for you guys to understand the function of cholesterol. It prevents them from aggregating and solidifying, thus maintaining the fluidity of the membrane. So they are super important, super, super important. The second function is that they maintain the integrity of the membrane by preventing the phospholipids from separating entirely, acting as a glue component. Again, it is immensely important for you guys to understand the function of cholesterol. Now let's spend let's spend a bit of time on transport, which I didn't want to spend a bit more time on the first slide uh, because I had the image right there, so it made it easy for me to explain. Um, but obviously, we didn't have that much space anymore, right? So. We need to make up for it. We need to make up for it by explaining it on this slide. Um, so transport is really important. And again, I wish I could do it on the first slide again. Because you need to see it how it occurs with the plasma membrane. But let's go through each component individually and maybe we can go back to the first slide and explain it there. So let's start with diffusion. Which is the passive net movement of molecules from a region of high concentration to a region of low concentration. So try and focus on the box here. You can see these molecules 
diffusing out. From an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. So it's just because of the random motion or the random movement of molecules, just by nature, that diffusion occurs. And as you can see, high concentration, low concentration, in equilibrium, they are dispersed everywhere. Now, there is a difference between passive transport and active transport, and thank God for the image that we have here. So, passive transport is the simple diffusion of molecules from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. Now, facilitated diffusion, it's still passive, because molecules are flowing according to the concentration gradient. They're flowing according to the concentration gradient, not against it, according to it, right? They're flowing down the concentration gradient from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. Facilitated diffusion just means that there are carrier or proteins or channel proteins that aid with molecules going from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration, right? Active transport, on the other hand, is the form of transfer, transport where ATP is used to, again, ATP is essentially an energy carrying molecule, um, but it's used to transport molecules against the concentration gradient from an area of low concentration to an area of high concentration. Can you see the squares here? That's an area of low concentration. You have only two squares above, but you have four squares below. And this carrier molecule apparently is still, it's still transporting these squares on the inside of the cell. Why? What could be, why, why would this be important? What could potentially be so important that the cell needs to transport towards itself? Do you guys have any idea? The answer is food, like glucose, right? The cell needs a lot of it. It needs to store it sometimes uh, because glucose is a source of energy, right? So. The cell needs to expend some ATP to get a ton of glucose in so it can produce, because remember, one molecule of glu glucose can produce 36 ATP, and don't worry, we're gonna cover that, as you can see on the progress bar. We're gonna cover that very soon. But that's why uh, that is really important. Now, let's look at some molecules that are transported through simple diffusion. Alcohols and steroids are the prime example because they can diffuse directly through the lipid bilayer. And another fun fact is the fact that alcohol can diffuse directly through the lipid bilayer that makes it such a dangerous drug, right? So alcohol, essentially, um, it can flow through the plasma membrane very easily, and therefore it can do the same thing between neurons, right? And essentially it can block sometimes transmission at the synapse of a neuron and that's why it makes some people a bit more relaxed or some people a bit more agitated because it does actually affect the way your brain functions and the, f the reason why it can do that so easily is because again it can be transported so easily through the blood right and between cells now what are other molecules that can obviously easily go through the plasma memory the, a very easy way to remember that is basically uh, think of the uh, main molecules, right? Like oxygen, carbon dioxide, water. Those are like the main molecules that you kind of need. Oxygen and carbon dioxide, we inhale and exhale, respectively. And obviously water we need. So those are the kinds of molecules that our bodies are designed in such a way to easily accept and get rid of. 
Facilitated diffusion, as I said, is the passive net movement of molecules across the plasma membrane via transport proteins. This can be the sodium potassium pump, right, uh, or um, transport of calcium or glucose and amino acids. Now, some of you might say, hey, Ray, I understand why you would need um, channel proteins and carrier proteins to transport glucose and amino acids because those are massive molecules. Glucose is a, a hydrocarbon like C6H12O6, right? Uh, it contains basically 24 atoms in it. And amino acids are essentially, they have a central carbon with a functional group, an amino group, and an acid group attached to it. They are the building blocks of proteins. But they are very, very, very hard to transport as well because they're massive, right? So we understand why facilitated diffusion is needed to aid the transport of such large molecules. How about charged molecules? Well, charged molecules are super polar. They are really, really, really polar. I mean, you can't get more, more polar, right? It's an ion at this stage. So yes, uh, you need something like the sodium potassium pump to allow sodium and potassium to flow through. That is not potassium, by the way, that's calcium. But you also need calcium. Uh, think of your bones, they need calcium. Active transport, as I stated before, um, essentially refers to the fact that uh, in order to transport molecules against the concentration gradient, sometimes you need energy, expand energy, obviously, uh, because you're doing something against what naturally would happen. And the cell does that when it needs food, as I said. How about osmosis? Well, osmosis is the diffusion of water. That's it. It's the net movement of water molecules across a semi-permeable membrane from a region of high concentration of water to a region of low concentration of water. Now, another thing that we need to cover before we, we move towards my favorite, favorite, favorite part. Is. The surface area to volume ratio. Um, the surface area to volume ratio, it's a very, I think you can learn it, you might be able to understand it more later, but essentially, uh, the higher the surface area to volume ratio, the easier it is to get molecules or substances towards the center or any, in any other part of the, in any other part of the cell, right? Because you can see as, um, the cell gets larger, the surface area to volume ratio actually gets significantly smaller, right? So it's harder to transport molecules from one corner of the cell towards the center. And because you need to, and because the cell needs to transport molecules continuously uh, close to the center, it needs a high surface area to volume ratio because that will make the job easier and more effective. So the cells have evolved to have an appropriate surface area to volume ratio. Actually, the higher the surface area to volume ratio, the better it is because um, the more efficient the transfer of molecules is. For example, Vili, a high surface area to volume ratio maximizes absorption of nutrients and for those of you that don't know what villi is it's essentially um what's line it's like small hairs lining our intestines uh and they're used to absorb as much food as possible
Now let's go through a couple of VR questions before we move on to photosynthesis and restoration. So six molecules that form part of the plasma membrane of an animal cell are shown below. The R portions of the molecule are on the outer surface of the cell. Both the S and the R portions of the membrane are free to move within the membrane. C, the S portions of the molecules represent the hydrophilic fatty acid tails. D, the S and R portions of the molecule together allow for the easy transport of amino acids. Can you guys take a guess which would be the right alternative? You can pause the recording before continuing. Uh, but the correct answer would be, drum roll please. The correct answer would be C. How about this question? Glucose can enter and exit the cells through the transport protein. Good one. When there is a higher concentration of glucose in the extracellular environment than the intracellular environment, the GLUT1 undergoes a conformational change from a T1 open state to a T2 closed state. This process is shown in the diagram below. This mode of transportation is a passive diffusion, osmosis, facilitated diffusion, or active transport. This should be a very, very easy question to answer. It's facilitated diffusion because it's moving along the concentration gradient. How about this question? The diagram below shows two different types of cells in epithelial tissue with different surface area to volume ratios. This one has a 2 to 1 surface area to volume ratio, and this one has a 3 to 1 surface area to volume ratio. The columnar cell can absorb nutrients more effectively than the. So, which one of the following is the most correct statement? The columnar cell can absorb nutrients more effectively efficiently than the squamous cell. The squamous cell completes metabolic processes more slowly than the columnar cell. The columnar cell is more likely to survive in its environment than the squamous cell, and the squamous cell can expel waste more efficiently than the columnar cell. Which one would be the correct answer? A, B, C, or D? I'll give you a moment to think about it. And the answer is D. Now we have to start talking about photosynthesis and cellular respiration. We need to start covering and talking about the concept of energy transformations. Now buckle up kids because this is going to be a very long ride. Uh, it's not hard, it's just that there is a lot to cover. So, let's start with photosynthetic autotrophs. They synthesize their own organic carbon compounds from inorganic materials using light as the energy source to do so. Then we have chemosynthetic autotrophs, which synthesize their own organic carbon compounds from inorganic material using energy derived from chemical processes. So photosynthetic ones use light, derive energy from light, chemosynthetic derive energy through Chemical processes and heterotrophs are reliant on intake and digestion of organic molecules from an external source. Now, let's cover a bit what ATP is before we continue. ATP 
is essentially adenosine triphosphate. Now, adenosine tri triphosphate can actually be broken down into adenosine diphosphate plus the phosphate molecule, and it's the last phosphate that can be broken, the last the bond of the last phosphate molecule, where the rest can be broken or reattached again. And energy can be obviously formed when that happens, right? You can release energy. Or you can store energy there. And that's a really important concept because people don't 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 realize it can go both ways, right? So when the bond is broken, uh, the energy is released and ADP plus P is the result of that. So this would be the reactant and this would be the product. So energy from catabolism or an exergonic energy releasing process will result in the formation of ADP. Energy for cellular work, such as energonic energy consuming processes, uh, will use that energy. No, oh, okay, that's funny. Uh, get it? Are you hungry? I could I could use a light snack. Light, because plants need light to grow and survive. Never mind. Okay, so uh, let's talk about photosynthesis a bit. Now I know you guys are bio one too, but I'll explain it as well as I can. In three four, you need to know a bit more about uh, these processes when we're talking about photosynthesis and cellular, cellular respiration in uh, 3 4 you basically also need to know the Kellogg and the Kerbs cycle but at the moment that's not that necessary or, or at all actually so uh, let's explain the basic concepts underpinning photosynthesis so uh, the process in which light energy is transformed into chemical energy is essentially the definition of photosynthesis, right? Photosynthesis, you synthesize energy by utilizing a light energy. So you convert light energy into chemical energy. But how do plants do this? Because this is a process that primarily occurs in plants. Uh, how do plants do this? Because it's phenomenal. They do this through um, an organelle which is called a chloroplast. Now chloroplasts are located primarily uh, in plant cells and they have essentially a pigment which is referred to as chlor chlorophyll. Now chlorophyll uh, is a pigment that can capture light and convert that energy into chemical energy. Uh, that pigment is located in the thylakoid membrane making up the chloroplast. And because it is located in the thylakoid membranes, uh, the membranes, when they're stuck together, they can form something that we call grana, right? And a part of the process occurs in the thylakoid membrane, and part of it doesn't. Depends whether we're talking about the light-dependent or the light-independent stage. In the thylakoid membrane is where the light-dependent stage occurs. In the stroma, which is essentially not part of the thylakoid membrane, is where the light independent stage of photosynthesis occurs. So, the chloroplast is the organelle that is the site of photosynthesis. It is essentially made up of an outer membrane and an inner membrane, where the grana stacks of thylakoid sites of the light depends are the site of the light dependent stage. And the stroma is the fluid matrix, uh, where it's the site of the light independent stage. Now, obviously, there are other stuff, for example, that you might need to know, such as the fact that granum is a stack of thylakoids and the lumen, but all, honestly, uh, there is, there's time for that. Focus on the main takeaway points. Because, honestly, what you're learning now, when I studied part of it at uni, it can go on forever. But, let's keep going. 
Talcos within their membranes contain photosynthetic pigments known as chlorophyll. These are the photosynthetic pigments which absorb the light energy used in photosynthesis. There are various types of chlorophyll, such as chlorophyll A and chlorophyll B. And these different types of chlorophyll absorb different wavelengths of light. Some are good at absorbing green, some are good at absorbing red, and so on. Now, Rubisco is a key enzyme involved in the Calvin cycle. The Calvin cycle is something that is uh, the process through which photosynthesis occurs. Its role is to fixate the carbon molecule from carbon dioxide into an organic molecule that the plant uses for energy storage, which eventually becomes glucose. So Rubisco is the enzyme that fixes carbon into the glucose form. During the Calvin cycle, Rubisco fixates carbon to become the organic molecule G3P, a three carbon molecule, where half of, uh, of a glucose molecule, two G3P molecules make one glucose. During this fixation process, carbon dioxide reacts with RUPP, five carbon molecule, to make a six carbon molecule that splits into two G3Ps. Now, this sounds like a lot of technical terms, if you were to go through this. Personally, I would say, again, this happens during the light independent reaction stage. Don't, don't spend too much time on it. Uh, not. Now, you do need to know it, don't get me wrong at all. Like, don't get me wrong at all. You do need to know it, absolutely. Um, but basically, it's saying the process of carbon fixation is facilitated by the enzyme uh, Rubisco, it occurs during the light independent reaction and it results in glucose being formed. That's all, right? Enzyme Rubisco fixes G3P into glucose, it all occurs during the light independent reaction. That's all. Now, you might see other molecules involved in here, such as NADPH. And all of that, those are still energy carrier molecules because ATP is not the only energy carrying molecule. There are other energy carrying molecules. And after the carbon cycle is finished, sugar will be the output and oxygen, obviously. Now, what is really important for VCE, and this is why the diagram is there, is for you guys to know the inputs and the outputs of photosynthesis. The inputs of photosynthesis are water, carbon dioxide, and light. The outputs are oxygen and sugar, but you also have to focus on the energy carrying molecules. Now, these ones kind of rotate during the Calvin cycle, where ATP can be converted into ATP plus phosphate, and NADPH can be converted into NADP. So this is a summary of the photosynth of photosynthesis. where essentially six carbon dioxide molecules plus six water molecules through light will form sugar and six oxygen molecules. Now, most plants will undergo photosynthesis via the pathway we've just looked at, and these are C3 plants. Under typical conditions, photosynthesis works well. However, in C3 plants, it can sometimes be inefficient. This is due to a process called photorespiration, which involves the enzyme Rubisco. Rubisco's role 
in the light independent stage is to fixate carbon, however during photorespiration it instead fixates oxygen. This wastes energy and uses up carbon molecules making photosynthesis inefficient. Photorespiration occurs when carbon dioxide levels are low. C4 plants are usually found in hotter areas. Therefore, to minimize water loss, C4 plants often have their stomata closed. Having closed stomata lowers the amount of carbon dioxide entering the plant, leading to photorespiration. To combat this, C4 plants separate the light-dependent and independent stages into different cells. In mesophyll cell, carbon dioxide is fixed into a molecule called malate. Malate is then transported into a bundle sheet cell, where it releases carbon dioxide that is fixated by rubisco. This means that even when it's hot, C4 plants can close their stomata, their stomata and still have a supply of carbon dioxide for Rubisco, preventing photorespiration from occurring. Now let's talk about CAM plants. CAM plants function in a similar way to C4 plants and are adapted mainly to dry environments. Instead of separating locations, CAM plants separate the light dependent plus independent reactions over time. Stomata are open at night when it is cooler and more humid and this is when CO2 enters the plant. It is then converted into mallet which is stored in the plant until the daytime. During the day, mallet releases carbon dioxide with rubisco fixes during the Calvin cycle. Can plants can also close their stomata during the day and still have a supply of carbon dioxide for rubisco, preventing photorespiration from occurring. So kind of that's the gist when it comes to photosynthesis, some of you might say, wow, that was a lot of information, and it actually is. Uh, but as long as you know the inputs and the outputs and the general gist of photosynthesis, like where it occurs and why it occurs, uh, you should be fine. So no need to overstress about some things. Now let's cover a bit of um, cellular uh, respiration content. Now during school, uh, some of the main details that you learn is <laughs> that uh, mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell. Well, today. We're going to break your heart a little bit because, I mean, you're not wrong, but there's quite a lot that goes into it. First of all, a cellular, cellular respiration is the process in which glucose is broken down to form ATP.
There are two types of cellular respiration. One is aerobic respiration and the other one is anaerobic respiration. One uses oxygen and the other one does not use oxygen. Now, cellular respiration occurs in the mitochondria. where essentially glucose is broken down in the presence of oxygen to form carbon dioxide and water, which is around 36 to 38 ATP. Now, we call this an exothermic reaction. A photosynthesis was an endothermic reaction, but we call this a exothermic reaction because energy is released into the environment. Now, keep in mind that glycolysis occurs in the cytoplasm, whereas Krebs cycle occurs in the mitochondrial matrix. We're going to cover what all those terms mean, so no need to stress. And the electron transport chain occurs in the Crystea. So let's start with anaerobic respiration. Well, it occurs in the cytoplasm, where glucose is broken down into lactic acid and two ATP molecules. Afterwards, glucose will be broken, or sorry, for animals, the very first stage during anaerobic respiration, glucose will be broken down into lactic acid and two ATP molecules for animals, for plants and yeast. It will be broken down into carbon dioxide and ethanol, and it, will, and it will produce two ATP. So again, when it comes to anaerobic respiration and the breakdown of glucose, in animals or mammals, it will be broken down into uh, lactic acid and two ATP, whereas for plants, it will be broken down into <coughs> carbon dioxide, ethanol, and two ATP. Uh, you can think about the fermentation of yeast, right? Now, for aerobic respiration to occur, it requires oxygen to be present. Um, it occurs in the mitochondria. And it requires a combination of water and carbon dioxide. And it results in more ATP being formed. Sorry, water and carbon dioxide are the actual outputs. For anaerobic respiration, no oxygen is required, required as we showed it before, glycolysis can occur in the cytoplasm, um, or the cytosol, because the cytoplasm is the cytosol plus the organelles. And with anaerobic respiration, uh, the products are lactic acid, for animals, ethanol and carbon dioxide for plants. And it results in significantly less ATP. So let's go through some Viga style questions to see if you guys understood what I've said so far. So the chloroplast is the organelle responsible for photosynthesis in eukaryotic cells. In chloroplasts, the light <coughs> independent reactions require water as the initial reactant. That's A. B. The light independent reactions occur in the inner membrane area. C. The final product of the reaction is glucose. D. The light reactions occur in the ground. The answer is D, that the light reactions occur in the corona. How about question 10? Let's look at this for a bit. How about question 10? 
uh, fermentation in yeast. A produces ethanol. B requires lactic acid. C involves the curbs cycle. D requires the presence of oxygen. Which one do you think is the correct answer? Well, of course, A, the fact that it produces ethanol is the correct answer. Now, I'm going to cover some other stuff which I didn't mention. So, let's do that. I'll Now what I will try and do is I will try and I will try and put side to side photosynthesis and cell respiration so you guys can see the connection between the two. So, during photosynthesis, essentially we have six carbon dioxide molecules plus six H2O, which will give us C6H12O6, C6, right? And um, during, the, during this time, the cell actually uses ATP. And ADP plus P will also be a byproduct. Therefore, we call this an endothermic reaction, an en a reaction which absorbs thermal energy in order for it to be processed. Then there is the exothermic reaction or aerobic respiration where C6 H12O6 plus 6O2 will lead to the formation of 6CO2 plus 6H2O. Plus 36 ATP. Now for this ATP to be formed, ATP needed to be on the reactive side, right? It is crucial to remember that a cellular aerobic cellular, cellular respiration is essentially an exothermic reaction. It is the oxidation of glucose into carbon dioxide and water. Whereas photosynthesis is an endothermic reaction. Photosynthesis uses up ATP, whereas cellular respiration produces ATP. But now we can move past that and start talking about adaptations. Now, adaptations are a characteristic that helps an organism survive in its environment. An adaptation is required over, acquired over a long period of time through evolution. To adapt refers to a short-term change leading to greater adjustment in one's environment. 
Adaptations can be physical, physiological, and behavioral. So let's look at these polar bears and the moth. The polar bears have this white fur covering them. Whereas the moth can almost blend in with the tree trunk. Why is that? Well, adaptations in themselves are only useful as long as they maximize the survivability of the animal, right? Of the organism, I should say. But what does it mean to maximize survivability? It means to increase the probability of the animal surviving, right? For example, polar bear bears with their physical adaptation of having that white fur to reflect um, the light means that it is easier for them to blend in with the surrounding environment, probably making it easier to hunt, for example. That's a good physical adaptation to have. That fur, which enables them to store a lot of air, and air is a good insulator, therefore preventing their body heat from ex escaping. That's probably a really good adaptation to have. How about the moth? Well, the moth has can blend in very well with the tree trunk. And the reason for that is because when it's able to blend in very well with the tree trunk, um, it increases its chances of surviving because it's harder for predators to identify it. <laughs> but adaptations, that's the thing though, where a lot of people get confused. Adaptations don't have to be behavioral only. Uh, sorry, don't have to be physical only. They can also be behavioral. For example, birds can migrate from one area to another. Or humans remove clothes when it gets hot, right? Or put on more clothes when it gets cold. That's a behavioral adaptation. Giraffes learn to extend their neck forward to get the leaves. Again, this is a behavioral adaptation. But let's not com uh, let's not let's not confuse let's not confuse adaptations with evolution. Now I need to check something really important. Let's not confuse adaptations with with evolution. Um, evolution is a trait of an organism that it increases its survivability when there is pressure from the surrounding environment. And because, for example, let's say tall giraffes are more capable of reaching leaves, uh, they are, it is more likely that they will survive, right? And because it is more likely that they will survive, it is because of that reason that the tall giraffe is more likely to pass down its genes. And because it is more likely to pass down its genes, it is more likely to have children, right, or it's more likely to have offspring that also will be as tall as the parent, right? And 
Obviously, if the only the tall giraffes are the ones that are reproducing, eventually the shorter giraffes will be wiped out of the population and only the tall ones will remain. So, um, that is very different from adaptations such as behavioral and physical adaptations. Now, let's talk about biomimicry a little bit. Biomimicry is the evolution of nature to fix human problems. It has roots in the Greek words bios, meaning life, and mimesis, meaning to imitate. Some examples of biomimicry include mimicking, mimicking, uh, or imitating. Uh, the aerodynamic shape of a bird's beak and using that on a train. When the when the aerodynam aerodynamic shape of a bird's beak is used on a train, essentially it can help the train maximize its speed. Now, obviously, us humans don't know everything, but nature basically knows a lot more than we do. And because nature knows a lot more than we do, of course, it's easier to get things right when, uh, when mimicking nature. In this case, uh, bullet trains moving really fast is an example of biomimicry.
But it's not the only case. I'm trying to think, that's why I'm slowing down, of other examples of, of biomimicry. Other examples of biomimicry, what would they be? Ah, oh, yes, there's a building in Dubai, I think, that obviously Dubai is really hot and they continuously have to come up with ways on how to cool a building. And by the way, cooling a building can actually be very hard. I personally used to do a bit of tech consulting for a company that is now involved in uh, maximizing the efficiency of cooling of cooling uh, buildings and yeah it's it's a really cool concept so basically uh, what they were doing in Dubai is that they were essentially trying to mimic how our arteries and veins pump blood around our body and uh, something along those lines they uh, try to mimic how water circulates in the human body or how our blood circulates and then that's how they try and um, cool the building I think something along those lines I'm not sure Biomimicry is a, it's a concept that has been around for a long time, but I, uh, me, just like most people out there, haven't really paid enough attention to it, I guess. For example, uh, and actually, yeah, on the topic of maintaining a constant environment, we can talk about homeostasis. This is just a meme, so no need to take it too seriously. <laughs> but what is homeostasis? Homeostasis? It's actually given in the name. It's the condition of a relatively stable internal environment maintained, and that's the key point, maintained within narrow limits. Homeostasis is achieved through the actions of the nervous and endocrine systems. So, let's talk about the um, endocrine system for a bit. The endocrine system is made up of glands that make hormones. Hormones are the body's chemical messengers. They carry information and instructions to and from cells. It starts with the pineal gland in the brain and the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland. Now, the endocrine system is actually a, a system which is different from other systems in the body. For example, the nervous system is all of it connected. The circ circulatory system, all of it connected. The respiratory system, all of it connected. The digestive system, all of it connected. The endocrine system, at first, is not all of it connected. It's just the sum of... Um,
It is essentially a sum of glands located throughout the body. Where the hypothalamus is the really important gland, so it is the pituitary gland, so is the pineal gland and the thyroid. Now all of the glands are really important <coughs> because they carry information and release instructions to and from cells. So it is a really important system. The nervous system, which is also an equally important system, is made up of the central nervous system, the CNS, and the peripheral nervous system, the PNS, where the central nervous system is made up of the brain and the spinal cord. Whereas the PNS, the peripheral nervous system, is made up of peripheral, peripheral, peripheral nerves. Uh, despite the naming, both of them are really, really important. <laughs> now, obviously this is about homeostasis and uh, we haven't talked much about homeostasis um, besides the definition. So I think it's my duty to kind of explain it a bit more besides the definition, right? So let's take into consideration, actually, let's go back here, sweating, right? So when we're talking about homeostasis, it means maintaining a constant internal environment. And let's use the endocrine system, for example. Uh, we're going to talk about sweating, we're going to talk about the endocrine system and probably other systems. But let's start with the endocrine system. We know that the pancreas will release two hormones. So one is called insulin, right? And the other one is called glucagon. When we eat a lot of sugary foods, what will happen is that there will be a lot of glucose There will be a lot of glucose released in our blood. A high glucose concentration will trigger insulin to be released from the pancreas. <coughs> As insulin is released from the pancreas, it will send signals to cells, it will travel through the bloodstream, first of all, and it will send signals to cells to take up glucose from the bloodstream, and it does so by binding to a receptor on the surface of the cell. So then, glucose is absorbed by different cells from the bloodstream. Now, as glucose is absorbed, the concentration of glucose in the bloodstream can fall. Sometimes it can fall 
below the normal concentration of what it should be. And if it falls below the normal concentration of it, what it should be, then there will be a signal sent to the pituitary gland and the pituitary gland will send signal to the pancreatic gland to release glucagon. Glucagon then will release sugar back into the bloodstream. But where was sugar initially stored when insulin was released into the bloodstream and it indicated to cells to take up as much sugar as possible? And from where was it broken down to and released back into the bloodstream? Well, Glucose is initially stored in the form of glycogen and hence the name glucagon when so when there is a lot of glucose present in the blood it will be stored back again in the form of glycogen. <coughs> and after it's stored in the form of glycogen when glucose levels fall below what they are required It's the, the body will send signals to break down glycogen back into glucose. Let's take another example of homeostasis. Another example of homeostasis would be sweating. So let's say we are working out. Whilst working out, we will start to eventually sweat. As we are sweating, we are releasing thermal energy back into uh, we're releasing thermal energy back into the outside environment. So the very reason we sweat it's because our body temperature it's actually re reaching levels that it shouldn't reach so it's going above certain levels and obviously there are enzymes in our body that cannot operate above a certain temperature right so enzymes are the things that carry out certain functions in our body they need to be operating optimally in order for them to operate optimally uh, they can only do so in all in, only in certain only in certain temperature ranges and obviously our body temperature needs to be in that range so that's why we sweat so let's say you're working out uh, the body temperature increases quite a bit as the body temperature increases quite a bit you will start to sweat sweating uh, will actually reduce the temperature of your body now how does sweating do that it does that by something that we call evaporative cooling so as the sweat evaporates from our skin, and this happens with other animals as well, as the sweat evaporates from our skin, 
it is essentially removing high energy particles from our skin because it is the high energy particles that can that can have enough energy to evaporate basically now let's talk about feedback loops for a second and let's go through some study tips when the time when we reach that time but yeah Um, feedback loops, they can be negative feedback loops or positive feedback loops. Negative feedback loops counteract the stimulus, such as thermoregulation. Positive feedback loops reinforces the stimulus, such as breastfeeding. Let's look at thermoregulation for a bit. Actually, it will be cooler if I just go through it slowly. First, let's talk about thermal regulation. Let's say when body temperature increases. It is first detected by thermoreceptors and the hypothalamus. Then it will be detected by the central nervous system, which will send signals to blood vessels, where blood vessels will send signal will start to vasodilate. where vasodilation is the process by which blood vessels will expand to allow more blood flow to go through them. Sweat glands will start to sweat, will start sweating, obviously, because sweating helps with evaporative cooling, don't forget that. And then cells lead to the reduction of metabolism, right, because as you reduce metabolism, they reduce the amount of heat energy which is being released during metabolism. All of this would aid to bring back the body into a homeostatic state where the temperature is what it should be. Now let's assume the temperature has dropped below normal levels. This will be detected by thermoreceptors again. 
and the hypothalamus, which will send signals to the central nervous system of what's happening. And as signals are sent to the central nervous system, eventually the central nervous system will send signals to blood vessels, which will result in vasoconstriction. It will send signals to skeletal muscles, which will result in shivering, right? So when you shiver, it's your central nervous system telling your body to start producing more heat energy. And then the cells will lead to an increase in metabolism. Obviously, shivering increasing metabolism will release more thermal energy with vasoconstriction as well. Uh, now, vasoconstriction actually does not release more energy. It just restricts the blood flow to the peripheral, peripheral sides of our body. So if this is our arm and then this is our skin, a vasoconstriction will again descend our blood, our blood, our veins and arteries from uh, the skin. So it will try and uh, reduce, uh, it will try and increase the distance between the skin and the blood to prevent heat energy from being lost, but it doesn't create more heat energy. So this is how homeostatic balance is maintained, right? So, so this is how thermal regulation is, happens. I hope this is all good. Another important one, which I did touch up upon a little bit, is blood glucose regulation. Now, this is detected by the receptors in the pancreas. Pancreas will release insulin and the insulin targets liver the liver to convert glucose to glycogen which will eventually lead to a decrease in blood glucose levels and result in a homeostatic state. However, if blood glucose levels fall a little bit too much, then this will be detected by the receptors in the pancreas. The pancreas then will release glucagon, which is a hormone that carries out the opposite function of insulin. Glucagon targets liver or it targets the liver to convert glycogen to glucose because yes the liver is where glycogen sometimes is stored
this will result in the release of glucose in the blood and therefore homeostasis will be achieved again. Now, obviously there are other examples, such as osmoregulation, which you also need to know, where uh, increased water levels in the body will be detected by osmoreceptors in the hypothalamus. Therefore, the hypothalamic, hypothalamic neurons will produce less ADH. And therefore, the posterior pituitary gland releases less ADH in the bloodstream, which results in decreased permeability in a distal convoluted tubule. therefore resulting in the body reaching homeostasis once again. However, if there is not enough water in the body, this will be detected again by osmoreceptors in the hypothalamus. The hypothalamic neurons will produce ADH, antidiuretic hormone. The posterior pituitary gland releases ADH in the bloodstream. which it will lead to an increased permeability in the distal convoluted tubule. And therefore homeostasis will be reached once more. Now we are reaching the end of our lecture, so I would like to cover some study tips for you guys. Now, let's go first of all through everything that we covered today. First of all, we talked a lot about the plasma membrane. We talked about the fluid mosaic model of the plasma membrane. We talked about the phospholipid bilayer and the importance of knowing the difference between hydrophilic and hydrophobic molecules. We said that there's going to be an extracellular and intracellular fluid, and that's where the phosphate heads will rotate towards. We referred to the mosaic model of the plasma membrane, given that it has different proteins embedded in it. Then, we started talking about the importance of cholesterol. And how cholesterol carries two important functions. One, to prevent phospholipids from aggregating. And interestingly enough, the other function is to uh, prevent them from separating as well. So it maintains the fluidity of the plasma membrane. Then we started talking about the fusion, active and passive transport. 
where we started to differentiate between simple diffusion and facilitated diffusion. And osmosis as well, and then we proved the importance of surface area to volume ratio. We also covered the function of the cilia in our intense times and related it back to the surface area to volume ratio, why that was an important factor. We talked about uh, respiration and photosynthesis. We said that photosynthesis is going to go, uh, it's going to use water and carbon dioxide and light to produce glucose and oxygen, which is essentially an endothermic reaction, whereas uh, respiration will be an exothermic reaction that will break down, it will oxidize glucose into carbon dioxide and water. After that, we talked about obviously the side at which all of them happen. So obviously we said that the photosynthesis, photosynthesis happens in the chloroplasts. And then there's also something, something, another cycle which is involved, which we refer to as the Calvin cycle. Then we talked about uh, the fact that respiration can be anaerobic or aerobic. Anaerobic, it can occur in the cytosol. Uh, where for animals the glucose will be broken down into lactic acid and two ATP molecules and for, and for plants it will be broken down into ethanol and two ATP molecules as well. However, when it comes to aerobic respiration, um, when it comes to aerobic respiration, oxygen will be used to break down glucose into carbon dioxide and water. And what and the cool thing is it will also produce ATP. What's really cool about this is that the inputs of photosynthesis are the outputs of uh, aerobic cellular respiration and the outputs of aerobic cellular respiration are the inputs of uh, photosynthesis or the inputs of cellular respiration are the outputs of photosynthesis. So it's a really interesting, uh, it's a really, really interesting kind of system. We said that C4 plants are primarily involved in it, then again, cellular respiration. Obviously, you need to know the function of the, my, of the chloroplast and the mitochondria well. Then we started talking about physical adaptations. Now, when we talked about physical adaptations, obviously, we emphasized the difference between uh, behavioral adaptations and uh, why... Uh, behavioral adaptations from the rest and why are those important. We also covered a very cool topic which is biomimicry and that is where we put a lot of emphasis on how humans are using, are taking, are taking notes basically from, um, from nature and they're learning from nature on how to manage uh, and solve some of their problems. Then uh, we talked about homeostasis, how to maintain a constant internal environment within narrow limits. And we talked about thermoregulation, blood, blood sugar regulation, and osmoregulation. Now, my final tips are very simple. Um, don't try and copy slabs of text. Uh, try and understand the text and try and use the study design as much as possible. Uh, practice as much as possible. That is really, really important. Practice. Uh, because practice will help to consolidate your knowledge, but don't get me wrong, theory is also really important. Sometimes when answering questions, be careful because there is no need for unnecessary details. List the organelle responsible for photosynthesis and say, well, A is the chloroplast, right? You don't have to say, oh, the organelle responsible for photosynthesis is the chloroplast. You don't have to say the light dependent stage occurs in the ground of the chloroplast and the light independent stage occurs in the stroma of the cytoplasm of the chloroplast. Even though we covered that, that is fine. But the thing is, you want to save up as much time as possible on the exam. And being concise is the best way to do that. 
always cut figures from the data and always cite uh, the units of measurement. Because if you don't, you might miss out on some marks. Finally, if asked to describe data, just comment on the trend. If asked to explain data, mention the re relevant biological concepts of on why things happen the way they do. If you deal with comparative questions, need to mention again both terms and compare them. A plant, for example, explain the difference between an animal and a plant cell. A plant cell has a cell wall, whereas an animal cell does not. You can't say a plant cell has a cell wall and nothing else, right? You can't just say cell wall. Every time Vika asks you a comparative question, uh, they put a lot of emphasis on using a comparative word um, because that's what the question is asking you is to compare. You can't just state only something, right? So you can't just say the cell wall. They don't really know what you mean by cell wall. You have to use sometimes full sentences and you have to be concise at the same time, which is a hard thing to do. <clears throat> and I understand why some people would be stressed about it. Overall though, I would say that as long as you practice, you're gonna do fine. Uh, thank you for Thank you for listening to this. Um, I appreciate you guys. And if you have any questions, please type it up on the chat box. You can find the slides attached as well. Um, thank you for joining the session. And hopefully I get to see some of you soon.